What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to Topic 3.6. We're doing land-based empires. This is our last land-based empire, so there's six of them all together that we're really focusing on. This is the final one, 1450 to 1750. This will end Unit 3. In terms of the videos, there's going to be a Unit 4, which will also be on 1450 to 1750, which is on European exploration. So all these gunpowder land-based empires are existing, mainly in the Eastern world meaning Eastern Europe all the way across Asia into South Asia. In the Western world, they're going to have overseas empires, which we'll get into in the next unit, and they will interact. There will be some connection between them, and you'll see that as we get into Unit 4. But let's just get into Unit 3 now. Why jump ahead? You know, I'm just trying to keep things simple. So let's do a little background here. Contextualization, if you're not sure what contextualization is still, I will tell you for another time, it is the background on something that helps you further understand the topic we're talking about. So it's basically what happened before this time period that can help better understand and lead us into this as opposed to just dropping us right down. So it gives better understanding to it. In this case, in the previous time period, the Mongols conquered Russia, which hopefully you remember. When the Mongols conquered Russia, the Mongols didn't like the Russian climate because they weren't used to it. So mostly they settled down in the southern part of Europe or southern part of what now is Russia. And in that region, they're going to settle. So they rule from afar and they allow the local princes to reign in power in Russia. And the princes are forced to pay tribute and give loyalty to the Mongols. This really what ends up happening is the local princes increase their power because they have the power to tax. And they tax at a higher rate than what the Mongols request. And therefore, they pocket some of the money. So it's going to increase the power of these princes. And in the late 1400s, the princes kind of because of this increase in power are able to dispel or kick out the Mongol rule and kind of just say, we're not paying this tribute anymore. And the Mongols have become so weak that there's nothing they can really essentially do about it. Also, I just want to point out a little contextualization that we didn't really talk about this, but it's important to note because it's going to come up later. The Russian, um, my, most people in Russia practice Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And the main church in Russia is called, at this time, is called the Russian Orthodox Church. Orthodox Christianity is not controlled like Roman Catholicism is from one central location, hence the Roman, Rome, Catholic Church. This is the Eastern Orthodox Church, and there are different branches of the Eastern Orthodox Church. There's the Russian Orthodox Church, there's the Greek Orthodox Church. So each area in the world can have their own kind of branch of this. And the leader of that is the prince or the czar, which we'll eventually get to. So there's a political connection and religious connection, Eastern Orthodox Church. They had converted to Eastern Orthodox Christianity through missionary activity in the Byzantine Empire. Remember, the Byzantines fell in 1453, but in the previous time period, 1250 to 1450, we see a lot of missionary activity and a lot of conversion in Russia to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. So there's a very big connection between Russia and the Byzantine Empire, which we're going to see in religion and culture and language and whatnot. In terms of expansion of this empire, if you're not getting this yet, I don't know what else to tell you. This is all about gunpowder. This period is gunpowder galore. If you have access to gunpowder, if you have access to guns and cannons, the people that you fight against who don't have access to guns and cannons are going to lose to you. And Russia is going to be able to expand in this period because of access to that stuff. Russia is mainly looking eastward, this way, for a lot of the early part of this period. This way, Western Europe, Britain, France, um, the Netherlands, they are looking west and they are attempting to explore in the 1500s. Russia is looking east and trying to consolidate power. The person who eventually, the prince who eventually consolidates this power, and consolidates just means like strengthens and like overthrows and takes over, um, is this guy Ivan the Terrible. He's seen as one of the first major leaders in the Russian Empire history. His descendants are going to be this group of people called the Romanovs. So again, Ivan the Terrible, obviously he was a great guy, Ivan the Terrible, his descendants are going to be the leaders called the Romanov family who are going to be in control from 1613 to 1917. So one more time, Ivan the Terrible, the Romanov family, that's the connection there. Under Ivan the Terrible and the future leaders, they are going to refer to themselves as a czar, which can be spelled two ways, C-Z-A-R or T-S-A-R. Both mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. It's when you, you translate from Russian into a Western European alphabet. The sound can have two different, it's the same thing. Czar, Tsar. Um, so this really means Caesar. The Russians believe that they are kind of the, 
uh, they have a tough, like, really good connection with the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire was part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire leader back in the day was Caesar and the Caesars who followed him. And therefore, the Russians see themselves as kind of the descendants of the Roman Empire, hence the name Tsar, which means Caesar. The leaders are totally autocratic, meaning that they have total control. That is a completely 100% centralized government, like a strong centralized government. Everything revolves around the Tsar. And they are, this word autocratic, the root of it, auto, means one. Cratic just means government. It's often referred to as well as an absolute monarch or absolute monarchy, meaning that there is total, absolute, no question about it, control by the monarch. And the monarch is the leader who has the final decision on all aspects of life. So the monarch decides, and that's how things go. Of course, like all these other leaders at the time, you got to build yourself some fancy stuff to show how important you are and show how autocratic you are and show how powerful you are and just show that you're the boss. And in this case, we see a couple things. One, we have an influence from the Eastern world early in this time period. So we see something like St. Basil's Cathedral. This looks nothing like what you would see in the Western world. So when I say Western, I mean, even if you're, you know, as, as someone living in the United States, you would not see anything like this. It looks, it looks like a Disneyland, Candyland, like you can bite off the top of it and eat it kind of thing. This is very Eastern, um, especially kind of, you can see some influence from the Byzantine Empire, some influence, almost like a little bit seemingly like Islamic influence, Persian um, So this is what we see early on. This is the most famous building in Russia called St. Basil's Cathedral, named after St. Basil. Um, on the other side, by the 1600s, the, they really realize in Russia that they're behind. And like I said, they've been looking this way. And Western Europe over here is going through all this in age of exploration. They're gaining wealth. And the Russians are like, oh, shoot, we've been looking this way. But maybe we should have been looking this way. And there becomes this uh, attempt to kind of imitate Western Europe, specifically France, which is kind of seen as the center of culture in the 1600s. So the palaces that are going to be built by these absolute Romanov monarchs are going to be very French in nature. So as we get into this next time period with European exploration, you're going to see that this is very French in terms of its architecture. If you've ever been to France or you know someone who has, you've seen pictures of what's called the Palace of Versailles. This is like a straight up total replica. It looks just like it in terms of it. So there's two different palaces here. The Tsar has his winter palace and his summer palace. Um, the winter palace is going to be in St. Petersburg and the winter, the summer palace is going to be in the south where it's a little bit cooler. Most leaders like to get out of the city in the summertime because it's a long time ago and it stunk really bad with horses and no toilets and a whole bunch of other stuff that we'll get into another day. But you can see very colorful. You see these like grand staircases um, that come down both ways. You can see how big this staircase is by this. You can see some archways. Um, just huge, enormous. And this takes an enormous amount of wealth to build these kind of palaces, um, which costs money. But also what costs money is you got to recruit these military soldiers and your bureaucrats. The way Russia works is to work either as a military official, not just a regular soldier, but a military high-ranking official or bureaucrat, you needed to get a promotion, which was supposed to be based on merit. But usually, and by merit, I mean you work hard, you do your thing, you pass tests, whatever, that's merit. But usually it doesn't work that way. Um, mostly it's usually done through patronage, like you pay or you support me and I give you something back. Or it's done through uh, familial lines. So I promote my son and he automatically becomes a high-ranking official, even though he might not be very smart. My son is smart. Um, the military is going to carry out the policies. So instead of bureaucrats going around and like explaining the law and carrying out those laws, it's going to be done by the military, which shows you that there's force involved here. So you're going to send the military out to be like, this is the law here. Don't mess with it. Otherwise, we're the military. Um, and again, like I said, the, there's a focus here on this expansion through military actions to gain access to warm water ports, which is why you see all the way down here. This is not going to be until the 1800s, but they're looking for areas here in the Sea of Japan um, in order to gain access. Because up here in the wintertime, as you'd imagine, it's super cold and freezing. A um, lot of taxation for this military control, for this expansion to build these palaces. you got to tax stuff. The Russians tax everything. There's a tax on going, like taking a bath, going to a bathhouse because you don't have a bath in your home. Uh, there's a tax on fishing. There's a tax on if you have a beard, they taxed you because they wanted people to get rid of their beards because they wanted them to look more like Western Europe. So this is a picture of Peter the Great cutting off people's beards. Um, 
they're going to take them they're going to put a monopoly meaning the government has total control over their most profitable industries producing of vodka salt making of tar furs so the government says we control this industry we might give you a we might agree to allow you to produce vodka but you need to come to us and we control who you can sell it to how much it costs and we control every aspect of that so this is hugely when you have a monopoly monopoly on something like the game you make a lot of money and if the government monopolizes something they can make a lot of profit off it in terms of the the peasants there's a flat tax meaning all pack all peasants pay the same rate it was all done through farm products there's no uh, coinage at this time in russia and also they put a high tariff or tax on foreign goods meaning if a product like um i don't know eventually we're gonna see rum the type of alcohol rum which comes from the caribbean if that tries to come into if people try and sell that into russia we're going to put a high tax on that and we're going to force the people who buy rum to pay a tax on it basically what this does is by putting a tax on foreign goods you encourage people to buy the russian goods which are going to cost less because you put such a high tax but if you really want that foreign good you will pay the tax and then the government takes that tax and uses it for themselves to build fancy palaces and a bureaucracy and a military and all that good stuff last but not least minority groups it is a very diverse empire in russia we are talking 12 modern time zones this is a huge swath of land all right this is like three times the length of the united states um so it's huge it's enormous and we're talking a time period where you don't have a lot of communication so it's very diverse the people who live in russia who are russian over here are going to be more of mongolian descent while the people over here are going to be more of european descent so it's going to be very diverse and what we're going to see is the beginning of what's called russification where they force the people in this empire who might not be russian by by nature by ethnicity because they're not because the people who are russian are from this region they're going to force them to speak russian press practice eastern orthodox christianity um be russian because they say you need to be like us who are the rulers so we're not going to see a very good tolerance necessarily we're also going to see extreme anti-semitism in russia this is a common theme in russia to this day is extreme anti-semitism anti-semitism is a hatred or dislike or discrimination against jewish people to be semitic is to be jewish so anti-semitism anti-jewish the jewish people even if you speak russian even if you're from eastern europe even if you look like the everyday russian who is dressing in russian clothing and cut off their beard you are not considered russian by the government all right so there's a huge discrimination of anti-semitism against jewish people which is not uncommon in the world then and it's one of the common themes that we see a uh, quick quote from peter the great i prefer to see in our midst nations professing muhammadism islam and paganism rather than jews the jews are rogues and cheats it is my endeavor to eradicate evil and not multiply it so this is the guy who's considered peter the great like the best leader in russian history who is preaching or discussing this anti-semitism so that's the treatment of one example of the treatment of minority groups as always that's all i got that wraps up unit three so congratulations we're three down we got six to go we're getting there um, as always any questions write it down let me know i'm out